He's dead. It was my mother calling from her Ohio home in the middle of the night. God damn it, Albert is dead. Albert was my uncle, my father's older brother, who at the age of 57 went to bed in Atlanta, Georgia, and never woke up. My father's side of the family is Jewish, so we had just 24 hours to book a flight and make our way to the funeral. Our daughter had just been born, so my wife had to stay home with her, and I decided to take our six-year-old son, Justin, to meet my father's side of the family for the first time. As the sun came up and the birds decided that it was light enough to sing, Justin and I boarded a flight to Atlanta. I saw the funeral as an opportunity for Justin to meet people who, up until that point, had only been a series of stories. I have no idea what he was thinking as I showed him a list of people he would meet with corresponding photographs. He was quiet. He rubbed the sleep out of his eyes and he nodded that he, that he understood, but how can a six-year-old understand that he was about to board a plane to Atlanta from Los Angeles to see people he didn't know to honor a man he had never met? That's what I was thinking when we were on the plane. But then suddenly it dawned on me. I didn't pack Justin anything that could pass as presentable to be worn at a funeral. As soon as we landed, we quickly popped into an airport clothing store and I bought Justin a white shirt that was too big and a clip-on tie that was too small. I was in a hurry and there wasn't any time to fix my mistakes. After a quick reunion with my parents filled with hugs and kisses, we rushed to pick up our rental car, a red eight-cylinder Lincoln Continental <laughs> with a hood that stuck out like a battering ram. It was after all the 90s. My father, a college music professor, loved to pretend that he was rich by renting obscenely big and expensive cars. We climbed into the ostentatiously huge Lincoln Continental and drove directly to the cemetery. The service had already started. Glenda, my uncle's widow, was reading from the Torah, and we tried to join the small clump of relatives we barely knew. We stood next to a mound of dirt piled beside my uncle's dark brown mahogany casket amidst an ocean of gravestones, a fragmented family next to neat rows of the dead. Justin kept pulling in a shirt tail that awkwardly spilled out of his pants, trying hard to look presentable with the ill-fitting costume that I made him wear. I pulled Justin behind a large gravestone just out of the family sight lines so I could help him maneuver the, his shirt in, into something more comfortable. As I was buckling Justin's pants and stuffing his shirt into his waistband, I saw Glinda march up to Albert's oldest daughter and emphatically point to Justin, and it suddenly dawned on me that Glinda thought that Justin was peeing on the gravestones. <laughs> I, I quickly buckled Justin's pants, and we scurried back as Albert was lowered into his grave, and, we each, including my six-year-old son, grabbed a clump of dirt and pensively tossed it onto Albert's coffin. I looked over at my father, who was standing at the edge of Albert's grave, staring down at his brother's eternal resting place. And the silence seemed so loud. And the tension so real that all I wanted to do was to eat a salty, warm handful of McDonald's french fries. <laughs> I know, I know. Don't judge. <laughs> we all have our ways of coping, right? I'm sure you can tell that I tend to eat the supersized version when I'm stressed. <laughs> that wasn't supposed to be funny. But <laughs> <laughs> I have always had a Jones for McDonald's fries as a relief from conflict. It's my drug. Healthier than heroin, not as effective as weed, but certainly more practical than drinking and driving. <laughs> That's the problem with planning a cross-country trip in just 24 hours. You, you're not prepared for the stress of family. But the golden arches were nowhere, nowhere around, and I had to focus. The french fries would have to wait. After the funeral, Glinda took my, my mother by the arm, and a heated whispered discussion soon brewed into an audible fight. Without turning around, I distinctly heard the word urinate. <laughs> and I knew exactly what it was about. My mother is a lioness when it comes to her young, especially her grand young. And she quickly countered with a 
go fuck yourself. <laughs> Which was right on point for my mother. Like Sir Lancelot, who suddenly woke, suddenly woke up from a peaceful sleep, my father pulled my mother away from Glinda, and we quickly piled into the car, unsettled but unscathed. We drove out of the cemetery to Glinda's house to sit Shiva, but the junkyard dogfight that started at the cemetery continued at the house. Back and forth, little quips quickly turned into an all-out assault between my mother and Glinda. Your grandson put his feet on the sofa. Go fuck yourself. <laughs> I cannot believe how ill-behaved your grandson is. And my mother's response, fuck off. <laughs> the night eventually came to an end, and we left the battlefield to our hotel in downtown Atlanta. It was then that I thought to myself, you know what? It's 11 o'clock at night. What I need are McDonald's french fries that I've been jonesing for all day. And when you know it, at that exact moment of need, a shimmering golden arch appeared like a thunderbolt flashing across the sky, and I immediately turned into the McDonald's drive through My mom continued to bitch about Glinda's attitude, and my father was pensively staring out the window. Justin took advantage of the situation and asked for a Happy Meal, but he just wanted a toy. No hamburger or french fries. I just want the toy car, Justin said, pointing at a picture in the menu of a Hot Wheels race car. Can you get a Happy Meal without the meal? It turns out that the answer is yes. <laughs> I ordered the toy along with a side of supersized fries. Then there was a white car that had been idling in front of us with no other, right in front of it, excuse me, sin, idly in front of us with no other car in front of it. But it didn't dawn on me how long it had been there because I was caught in the crossfire of the drama in the back seat in the form of my mother. Suddenly, the white car pulled off to the side, and thinking little of it, I pulled up the drive through window. My mother said something unique along the lines of that fucking bitch, and I, <laughs> and I turned to her and I said, will you stop? I cannot take it anymore. Then Justin repeated one more time, can I get my toy? And I said, I'll get you your Happy Meal toy. And then I turned to the drive through window and I found myself face to face with the barrel of a gun. A rather fluffy man whose face was covered by a red, band red bandana was reaching out through the drive through window, his long arm extending all the way into the car with a barrel of a pistol pressed precariously against my forehead. Execution style. I had the following choices available to me. Don't move. And hope beyond hope that this man whose face was behind a red bandana does not shoot me and my family. Choice two, wrestle the gun out of this man's hand. Or choice number three, Slam my right foot through the gas pedal, surging gasoline into all eight cylinders of our Lincoln Continental. That is, of course, what I did. The red, the rear tires screeched like a scene from Rebel Without a Cause. My father finally broke his silence and screamed, what's happening? I shouted back, gun, gun, he's got a gun. As we sped out of the McDonald's drive through the white car, which I soon realized was the getaway car, idling by the side of the restaurant, raced to block the exit of the driveway. I thought about crashing right through that white car with our red battering ram, but it was a good thing I didn't. I didn't know it at the time, but when Justin saw the gun, he immediately unsnapped his seatbelt and crawled underneath the dashboard. He would have died if I crashed through that white car. Instead, I swerved around the white getaway car onto the embankment and sidewalk and then slipped over to the road and then zoomed at full speed away from the McDonald's and the white car and the man and the red bandana and the gun. Once we were far, far away from the Golden Arch dystopia, my father said, we have to stop. They're murdering people in there. <laughs> he had a point. I stopped at a payphone and I called the police. I dialed 911 and said, I would like to report a robbery at the McDonald's in Buckhead. And the person on the other end said, 
Well, we've already had that incident reported, and we have a description of the getaway car. You guessed it. The victims of the robbery described the getaway car as a red Lincoln Continental. <laughs> there was another McDonald's robbery later that evening, and the police cornered the McDonald's robbers in a white car. There was a shootout between the robbers and the police that resulted in the death of a few of the perpetrators. Clearly, the red bandana man was more than capable of using his gun. Their arrest, however, did mean that we were off the hook and the police were no longer looking for a red Lincoln Continental. It was past one in the morning when we finally made it to our hotel. I could not bend my right knee. The muscles were still in panic mode and my brain couldn't find a way to tell my muscles that we were no longer in danger. As soon as we walked into our hotel, Justin turned on the TV and sat on the edge of the bed and silently stared at an episode of Sesame Street. As Ernie played with a rubber ducky, I asked him how he was doing, but he simply shrugged his shoulders without taking his eyes off the TV. When we returned to LA, the first thing I did was to get back on the horse and buy Justin that McDonald's Happy Meal with a Hot Wheels car, without the burger, fries, or drink, of course. Justin is now 37 years old, and he has two young daughters. And every now and then, I ask him if he remembers anything from that night when he and I flew to Atlanta for my uncle's funeral. Oh, yes, he says, the tone of his voice fluttering up with recognition. But then he never says anything more than that. In fact, he usually changes the subject. And while my feeble attempt to create an extended family of him for him backfired, Justin has never had contact with Glenda since. <laughs> the shared experience of a funeral turned robbery forged a silent bond between the four of us in that car. And I haven't looked at McDonald's fries the same way, <laughs> which is probably a good thing. Brent Bierman, everyone.